So let's learn how to do a family tree or pedigree as we say. So this is a multi-generational thing with the youngest generation at the bottom. You see the ages there and then it kind of goes up. So if you're married, you have a crossbar and then if you have children, it drops down and then they have kind of a dangling head. Women are circles and men are squares because we know, right, the ladies know that when it comes to health and taking care of yourself, the men are generally squares. So that's why the women run the world. Um, so here we have, and then if you have a condition, so in this one, they're all the same color. When we make family trees and we always give them out to people if they want them, you get kind of color coded based on what that disorder is so that you can visually sort of see this looks like it's running through the family. You don't have to construct that, but I want you to know that Thanksgiving I, is really been declared National Family History Day. So if you come to my house on Thanksgiving, there's a board, everybody has to fill in like what's happened in your health history this year before you sit down to get any turkey and cranberry sauce. But you can use it as an opportunity, right? You're gathering together. It is a, that you have a, the shared historical memory of elders who are there. It's a time to sign up, kind of explore. It's, um, there is often a lot of um, mystery around older generations. There was a lot of, um, you know, prohibition to talking about health-related things, particularly in our grandparents' generation or our parents' generation. And so to try to get that information as you can. You can also now, you know, and if you get into genealogy, if you get into the ancestry.com, they have all kinds of tools to be able to get death certificates, to get family relationships, to get things sort of squared away that were perhaps totally mis, you know, misperceptions of what was really going on in life. Really, really powerful tools that, that can empower you and your family in terms of having that collective knowledge. So in the last five years, there was this explosion in genetic testing. And this is sort of the cascade of things. The important things that happened at the same time, there were sort of three things that happened at the same time. One was that the technology changed. Suddenly, what we now refer to as next generation sequencing was there was a um, proof of principle that you could look at multiple genetic changes all different kinds at the same time with very high fidelity at very low cost. In the 90s and in the, through the early 2000s, testing, genetic testing was inordinately expensive. It was very labor intensive. It was very time and cost intensive. To test for the two BRCA genes commercially was four th up to $4,000, right? Incredibly cost inefficient because if you didn't have a mutation there and you wanted to even go on to the next gene, it could be several thousand dollars to do the next one. Now suddenly you could look at up to hundreds of genes at the same time and the turnaround was very quick. In addition, Angelina Jolie puts out her article about being a BRCA carrier and now suddenly on the front page of the New York Times is this very poignant story about her risk and the decisions that she's made to have risk reducing surgery and bringing that to a conversation that was really never commonplace. At the same time was the crossroads of a long time um, fight over patenting of the BRCA genes. So it's like this crux of the you know social, political, commercial, all of these things came together in the world and our little world of genetics at the same time. That patent dispute went all the way to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, excuse me, the Supreme Court overturns the BRCA patent, releases what was a monopoly on the BRCA testing itself or the BRCA gene testing, and now suddenly there was the ability for innovation and commercial competition. Where just a few years ago, there was only a test for, B for breast cancer genes. You would do BRCA1 and 2, or you would do a test for colon cancer that had one or two genes on it. Now, uniformly, we look at dozens of genes at the same time, and the cost has plummeted. There has been an exponential reverse in the cost to the amount of information and technology. 
this is a platform that we now very commonly use. Uh, there are multiple excellent labs. They're different in terms of what their offerings are. We make choices on what kind of lab we use based on the condition or, or what the needs and desires are of the patient. This is different than cholesterol testing or other testing you may come in. There's a lot of shared decision making in genetics. You have a role in saying, you know what, this is the level of information that I feel comfortable with at this time. I only want to test for prostate cancer related genes because that's what I have and my father had and my brother had and I don't really want to explore out beyond that. Or you may say, if I have the opportunity to look for any hereditary susceptibility with this test for no additional cost and it's going to be covered by my insurance, I feel like I can handle that information with the medical um, clinical guide to kind of navigate that. So people make all kinds of decisions and they may make them in tiers. So who should have genetic testing? Here's a little bit about that number when I crossed out the 10% and I said kind of it's going up and where is it? So now we know that probably at least 20% of all breast cancer, regardless of age, regardless of whether it's the first time or whether you've had more, whether or not there's anybody in your family history, that up to 20%, we may find a genetic susceptibility. This is not something in the tumor itself. This is saying this is why you were vulnerable. And not only were you vulnerable to this breast cancer, but your family members may be vulnerable and you may be at higher risk for having another event. In a very specific kind of breast cancer called estrogen negative or triple negative breast cancer, there were, these were um, studies that started to push the shoulders out and say, are we too narrow in thinking about who is at risk from a hereditary standpoint? You used to need, when they looked for the gene hunting studies, you had to have five affected family members. Somebody had to be under the age of 40. You had to have people who had more than one cancers, breast, ovarian. I mean, really neon signs. And that's how the discovery took place. And that was sort of our early platform for saying, well, this must be what hereditary cancer is. Now, the more we look, the more we find. Ovarian cancer. And all of these then have become translated into national guidelines, which then translates into the insurance guidelines to say, we have to pay for it. If any woman has had ovarian cancer or you have a family member with, a, with ovarian cancer, automatically covered for, for genetic testing. If you have this particular kind of breast cancer, meaning triple negative, no hormone receptors, and you're under the age of 60, doesn't matter if you have no family history, insurance has to pay for it. So these are the kind of guidelines that have really pushed out. More importantly is that 80% of women who get breast cancer don't have an overwhelming family history. The flip side of that is that you know up to a third have some family history. So really trying to figure out who has a, a single gene and who has this genomic load, that's what's gonna keep us busy for the next decade. Here's a short list. So this is something that's kind of good to kind of write down, think about. This is what we always talk about with clinicians when we do um, uh, in-services and educational. That these are sort of the no matter what. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter if you don't know anything about your family history. Doesn't matter if you have 14 brothers and sisters and nobody else has had cancer. All of these are indications for genetic testing because there is a significant likelihood that we could find something. And then it becomes a whole combination of sort of the family history. So this is why it's empowering to be able to kind of put together and have that information. And if you make an appointment to come in, we ask you to help build your family tree. It's not like we're not gonna evaluate you if you don't know, people don't, are estranged from their families, people have, are adopted, there are all kinds of reasons why you just don't know, lost in the war, all kinds of things. But if you have the capacity to get that information, why not try to get it while you still have that memory from family members? We evaluate for many things outside of cancer. The, a lot of this talk will come back grounded to the cancer genetics because there has been the most number, the, really the greatest advances related to risk assessment in the cancer domain. The rest are sort of moving along and catching up, but these are all categories of areas where we evaluate people for. Um, there are hereditary susceptibilities to getting aneurysms, for example, particularly if they're in your chest, so they're called thoracic aneurysms. There are hereditary susceptibilities to neurodegenerative disorders. 
So people come in often very worried about things like Alzheimer's disease. There is a small component of highly hereditary Alzheimer's disease, and then there's this genomic vulnerability, which we'll talk about later in the talk briefly, for Alzheimer's disease. But Parkinson's and more rare, very distinctive neuro neurologic degenerative diseases of adulthood often have a high hereditary component. And then there are things like polycystic kidney disease, things that if you don't have it, you'll never have heard of it, but if you do have it, you should definitely know that there is genetic testing related to it. This is an iron overload, for example, and other things. We also see people who are uh, at the point where they're family, thinking about family planning, and this too has totally changed. So it used to be, if you were African American, we would talk to you about sickle cell. If you came from a Jewish background, we would talk to you about Tay-Sachs, and that was sort of, that's it. Now we universally, we offer carrier testing for hundreds of diseases, risk that doesn't affect that person, but if they and their partner happen to carry the same genetic chain that could affect the future offspring, universally test everybody who wants it for all the conditions. So I'm gonna briefly talk about kind of where things are related to cancer risk, and I'm gonna talk, use the, the BRCA or the BRCA genes as that model not, this is not a hereditary cancer talk specific because all of these things I could talk about for an hour, just the one condition. But it's really to give you a taste for how we are addressing these kinds of risks and how are we managing them. So BRCA1 and BRCA2 are two different genes and they actually have different risks associated with one or the other in both men and women and the level of risk for the cancers that they are associated with. So there you see these broad range in numbers. Part of that has to do with whether it's BRCA1 or BRCA2, and part of it is very importantly what has evolved over our understanding of what's called the penetrance, or the likelihood that if you carry a genetic change, you're gonna get cancer. Because isn't that what you wanna know? I have this genetic susceptibility, I'm healthy now, what's the chance I'm gonna get breast cancer or I'm gonna get prostate cancer in the next 10 years, in the next 30 years? And what can I do about it? Because I don't wanna just know that I have this risk. So um, this looks complicated, but I wanna walk you through it because this is what we use in clinic. We have now, because the original studies were based on small numbers, a few hundred of very early breast cancer, a few hundred people who came in because they had prostate or pancreatic cancer, and then we looked at those families, which were already enriched because they man managed to get to sort of you know high-risk clinics in the first place, and then that's what we said, what are the risks to unaffected people? Now with tens of thousands of carriers that we can follow much more at a population base and say, what are those risks? That's where these, these numbers are now coming from, from big collective studies of BRCA, for example. That's where we have the biggest numbers. These are aggregates of 10,000 carriers with and without cancers followed over time. And these are lifetime risks. So the paradox is the younger you are, the bigger the risk is because you have all, you have 50 years that we don't know, right? If you walk into my clinic and you're 67 years old and you have not had cancer, you have outrun all the years up until 67. So your lifetime risk is not the same. You know, it, that 80% number, we don't use that even anymore, the 70% lifetime risk doesn't apply to you and it certainly doesn't apply to you today, this year. So I think it's very important to break down that risk by decade and say, where are you now? What's your risk in the next 10 years? And what is the best intervention for you? And then the longer you go, right, you can see, right? So if you walk in and you're over here, there's your risk. Your risk is 16% from the age of 65 to the age of 80. And we don't expect you to you know, pack it in at 80, but that's just where the, we don't have numbers really. Uh, beyond age 80. So all these lifetime risks go to age 70 or go to age 80, depending on how the studies work. So this is how we kind of help people become informed in a way that's tangible and meaningful to them to like, well, what do I need to do right now? And what am I, what's my plan for five years? And what might be my plan for the next 10 or, or 20 years? It's a trident's fork, right? 
increased surveillance, is there medical prevention, and should you consider surgical prevention? What gets all the press is the surgical prevention, right? What was on the cover when Angelina Jolie told her story? She was talking about having preventive mastectomies. It is often very aversive to people to think about taking out body parts that are currently healthy in order to prevent risk, right? It's a shocking concept. It's not something that people usually just march in going, sign me up. But it is one of a suite of things that are offered to people who are at inordinately increased risk. And so nobody should, come, when, nobody should say to you, if you're not going to have surgery, if we find a hereditary risk, you shouldn't have testing. Because that doesn't make any sense. Because there is a whole variety of other things that can be done and that we do do. And sometimes people start one place, and then eventually they get to another place. So this is just an example of some of the things that we do. High risk for surveillance for breast cancer, for example. So routine mammograms, right? So things that are population, get your colonoscopy, get your mammograms, these things. We might start earlier, 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier. We might combine it with more sophisticated imaging, like a breast MRI. These things also covered by insurance. They're mandated for coverage if you have these hereditary susceptibilities. Colonoscopy, so routine colonoscopy recommended at age 45 now, not at age 50 for the general population. And every 10 years, people who have certain hereditary conditions, we do colonoscopy every year gets covered by insurance. It is you know, a burden, like you don't really want to do that prep every year if you don't have to, but if we know that we can find polyps and we can prevent cancer, it's a pretty good alternative than to sitting around and waiting. There are a variety of medications that I prescribe for people to reduce their risk. You may not know it, but using um, contraception, for example, for medical prevention, reduces your risk of ovarian cancer by 60%. It is one of the most powerful preventive medications that we have. There's medications specifically for the prevention of breast cancer. Aspirin, I put people who are on high risk for colon cancer on very specific doses of aspirin for prevention, and we have the outcome data to show that this works. Risk-reducing surgery for those who it is appropriate for is extraordinarily effective but everybody has to get to where is the right decision for them. Um, modifying your lifestyle. So sometimes it takes being galvanized by having, knowing that you're actually at risk that will make you take control of the things that are in your life. So we talk about all of these things and they're in fact very profound. So in the preventability of cancer, there was the National Health Study looked at a big cohort of women and men, and they categorize them as being low-risk lifestyle, and then you're sort of the perfect low-risk lifestyle. You don't smoke, you drink less than a, uh, one drink a day. I'm sorry, that's supposed to be less than. Uh, one drink for women, two drinks for men. <laughs> yeah, it might be good for your life. <laughs> What's that thing, right? I'd rather you know live well than, than live long. Um, Exercising 75 minutes vigorously or 150 minutes a week, which translates to 30 minutes a day for five, over five days a week. And a, and a body mass ignites, in other words, your weight to height ratio um, between 18 and 27. So not too skinny and not overweight. That's the low risk. Everybody else just got plopped into high risk. It doesn't, it's not, you know, it, they dichotomize it. Obviously there's a gradation. But looking at it in that stratification from the best of circumstance to any other combination, the estimation of what the attributable risk, 20 to 40% of all cancers and half of cancer death could be prevented by modification of lifestyle. If there is nothing else to galvanize you into action, it is that kind of statistic that, that you can, in fact, change the course of your health natural history by changing these modifiable things. And it is in the hereditary setting as well as in the sporadic setting. Though you can't probably eat your way out of a hereditary cancer risk, you certainly can modify it. So let's talk about a case, and I'm going to sprinkle them through uh, over the course of the, the talk. 
This is an unaffected BRCA carrier. So she carries a BRCA2. And to orient you, the arrow is where she comes in. At the time, she's 39. She had one young baby. And she knew that she had this hereditary susceptibility. She was both a uh, um, information seeker and kind of fearful of m medical technology. She was not getting mammograms because she did not want radiation. She was using this alternative approach of getting um, an ultrasound, which has uh, a role but is not standard of care in terms of looking for breast cancer. And she uh, really was not interested at all in kind of doing anything beyond that. But yet she had come to clinic, right? So she had done something to step forward to say, I want to just make sure she really wanted to have another baby and she wanted to protect herself. So she came from this family where her mother had breast cancer at 44, her grandmother had breast cancer, and she was unaffected. So I did a specialized test which looked at her genomic risk. So it was uh, a um, study to look at was she, in addition to carrying this BRCA mutation, in a very high risk group for breast cancer or in not so high risk in her individually. It turned out that her genomic risk was very high. So not only did she have this BRCA mutation, but she on that curve was probably in the highest risk group for ultimately developing breast cancer. Now she was galvanized. Now she was m changed her orientation. She went and had a breast MRI, and the breast MRI uh, suggested that there was something going on, and she elected to have a preventive mastectomy. She had a bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction immediately. The skin is spared. Everything on the outside is sort of spared. It's just the inside that's taken away. And they found early cancer. It's called ductal carcinoma in situ. So this is not life-threatening cancer. But if this is left and becomes invasive cancer, it would then have the ability to potentially become metastatic and become life-threatening. It was high grade. She felt like she, that this was the ultimate save, that she, she acted when she was ready, and what she did was prevent the opportunity for her to get her cancer. Then she suddenly became like the champion of BRCA. So here she is. Her mother is visiting. Her mother has this pretty extraordinary family history of breast cancer, very early breast cancer. You can't see these numbers, it doesn't matter, but you can follow the colors, right? So there's breast in three generations, there's a ton of colon cancer. So she wants her mother to get tested. Her mother, and sorry, her mother-in-law. This is her husband, there's her mother-in-law. Genetic testing, mom agrees. She has a BRCA1 mutation. Her husband carries the same mutation. He's a big, she has a bunch of siblings. So now she has a BRCA mutation, her husband has a BRCA1 mutation, and they had this child. There's a whole group of people here go on to have additional testing. Meanwhile, a year or so later, the mother-in-law develops pancreatic cancer. Because it is related to BRCA, she was living in Washington, we were able to get her involved in a study at that time with a targeted therapeutic that is specific to BRCA-related cancers. And she did surprisingly well. Her sister, when she went to have her preventive ovarian surgery, was found to have early stage ovarian cancer at the time of her preventive surgery. So what are the lessons? One, genetics is a family affair, right? You can't step into the world of genetics without touching every degree that you are related. In all of medicine, this is the case, but probably no more so than in genetics, where when, when we have information for one, it becomes information for the collective. You have to meet people where they are. Not everybody is going to come marching in with their bag, ready to say, test me for everything, and I'm going to do the ultimate. And, you know, If I get found to be carried for something, sign me up. I'm going to go have surgery tomorrow. That's just not what needs to be done. Everybody needs to, to start where they start and get to where they need to be to be the, the, the champion of their own health destiny. And that the power from hereditary risk assessment has to be that it's proactive and not reactive. Yes, these people had cancer. Had we been able to, to 
catch this woman earlier and do her preventive surgery before she had ovarian cancer at all? Would have that been better? Unquestionably. But if we caught it at an early stage, it's certainly better than waiting for her to pre present with stage four ovarian cancer, which is how most ovarian cancers present. Pancreatic cancer is really a challenge. Anybody who has pancreatic cancer within their family will know that it is this silent disease until it is advanced. We have the opportunity, actually we're starting, starting in the beginning of next year, a high-risk pancreatic uh, screening program for anybody who has familial or hereditary risk, and it's gonna be throughout LA. So if you have family uh, risk for pancreatic cancer and want um, an evaluation, we're very excited about trying to figure out what is the best surveillance. There is screening for pancreatic cancer. We do it with an endoscopic ultrasound or a specialized imaging MRI. And there's a lot of work going into looking at blood markers to try to say, can we pick out people who are at the earliest risk? Stage one pancreatic cancer is totally curable. The ultimate goal is to not get cancer at all. But if you can catch stage one versus stage four, you're a far better place. Okay, so let's come back to that. Who should have genetic testing? So it is estimated that 90% of people who carry a genetic susceptibility to cancer don't know it. Welcome to your room, right? So this is where things have totally changed. It is not about the neon sign. It is about the universal screening. It is about finding the people who you wouldn't expect to have a hereditary susceptibility and getting to them before they present with cancer. So we've done a number of things here at Little Company, for example, if you come for your mammogram, ladies are getting mammograms here, you should get a screening questionnaire. And it is a very brief yes, no, with a trigger that if you have any yes, it's a, that means that you meet the, the criteria, the standardized now national guidelines to have hereditary cancer testing for breast, ovarian, colon, uterine cancer. So this is something we're trying to do to implement to say people who may not know that their family is, is one that is at risk or their personal history or that their primary care providers just may not have recognized that. This is a case of a woman who came in for her routine mammogram. She was 59. She came in every year for her mammogram. She fills out one of these screeners and she screened positive and she came in for a consultation. Her family history so she's here, she's unaffected, she has multiple siblings, and she says, well, my sister had colon cancer and uterine cancer at the same time, and then she had breast cancer. And her son had colon cancer at age 12. So she undergoes a comprehensive evaluation. Testing reveals that she carries a genetic susceptibility to a condition called Lynch syndrome, and it's um, an unfortunate epitaph that it's named after a doctor whose name was Henry Lynch and he was a marvelous doctor, but people hear it and they think of like this kind of Lynch, like, you're, like game over. But the Lynch syndrome, let's talk about what Lynch syndrome is because Lynch syndrome is the most common hereditary cause of colon cancer. So here's our pedigree and what do we see? We see colon cancer and gynecologic cancers. So depending on when it was first described, there were gynecologists talking about women who were at risk for uterine cancer and they seemed to have family members with colon. And then the GI docs were talking about people who had a lot of colon cancer and their female relatives seemed to be getting uterus and what we call endometrial and ovarian cancer. But there are a whole variety of other cancers that can be seen with this condition. 5%, four to 5% of unselected colon cancer Anybody with colon cancer, up to maybe one in 20, 25 people will carry one of these susceptibilities, even if they're older, even if they have no family history. Uterine cancer, unselected, the same thing, three to 4% of those. So how do we get to those people? What we have done through Providence and is that here like at Little Company, universal tumor team, if you have had colon cancer or uterine cancer, in the pathology department, we are able to screen to see, is there a missing protein related to this hereditary susceptibility? And if that screen is positive, there is a contact system so that genetics is contacted, we reach out to the clinical providers and we reach out to the patients to say, hey, we, we tested your tumor and it seems to be that there is a, the potential for this hereditary susceptibility. Would you like to come in to get further evaluation? This is how we're moving from sort of the bench to bedside, from bedside by back. 
We used to wait for this kind of family history to walk through the door, and we would only test people when they had three generations, and somebody had to be very early, and somebody had to have more than one cancer, or there had to be this whole combination before they would be eligible. And now anybody who screens positive, independent of age or family history, is eligible for genetic testing. So back to our lady. So she was the 59-year-old. She got referred to have a hysterectomy. She was already past menopause. She was at high risk for uterus cancer. She was at high risk for ovarian cancer. She was also recommended to have a colonoscopy, which she had not had. Unfortunately for her, she delayed her colonoscopy. She was lost to us for about eight months. She didn't follow up, and then she presented to the emergency room with bleeding. She had a large colon tumor at that time, um, and uh, she had to have surgery. But because she had this known Lynch syndrome, because she had this particular vulnerability in her tumor, she also could get immunotherapy, a targeted therapeutic, which was exquisitely sensitive on her cancer, and she is now doing beautifully with no evidence of disease. She's gone ahead and had her hysterectomy, and now, again, galvanized her whole family. All of her adult children have come in for predictive testing. Three of the four of them were negative, which means they are not at risk for any of these disorders. And the, uh, I'm sorry, I think it's two and two. So two were kind of off the hook, and the other two who are positive have activated in terms of getting their screening colonoscopies, in terms of changing their lifestyles and taking aspirin. So in this shift to the universal screening, a few years ago, these two guys who were Twitter guys, one of them, they were motivated. Lakari was a, a BRCA2 carrier, and the other one was a PhD from MIT. And they said, we need to bring genetics to the mainstream. We're going to start a tech company for genetics. And basically, that's what they did. And at the time, we said, is this going to scale? Are they going to have good clinical testing? Can they do it? And they said, for 250 bucks, we're going to have doctors who will order testing, who will, will have genetic counselors, will do it all virtually, and we can bring testing to anybody who wants it. And indeed, they were able to scale this. And they have done a lot to change the face of the accessibility of genetic testing. So if you have heard of this or have people who have had this testing, that's what it is. It's very targeted to breast, ovarian, and colon cancer genes. And it's part of now this big University of California study called the Athena study, looking at women to try to pick out the same thing. Anybody who's getting a mammogram, offering them genetic testing. A totally different model than what we've done even just to a few years ago. We at Providence have been involved with uh, another kind of um, innovative tech molecular company called Invite, and they said, okay, we get this, we can do it too, but we're going to do a genetic, offer genetic screening for health conditions, cardiovascular, hereditary cancer, comprehensively. The biggest platform in terms of everything that is an actionable gene, you can have access to that. If you have a clinical family history, this is covered by insurance. But for people who are outside of that, who have a personal history of cancer, they just had breast cancer themselves at age 70 and they don't have any family history, they would not meet the Medicare criteria, for example. But maybe that information is still important to them. We know that there's a significant likelihood that we're going to find a mutation. In fact, it's about 1 in 20 people who are healthy that we have in the studies that I've been a part of that we've been looking at these outcomes, about 5% we detect an actionable change in one of these genes, whether it be cancer or related to risk for, for having a clot or uh, risk for having extraordinarily high lipids, cholesterol, all of these things that we can intervene before somebody ends up with disease. So this is something that we have accessible to anybody who wants it. So let me shift now to sort of the genomics. And how's everybody doing? Because I know it's like super ton of information overload. OK. So genomics, genetics, like what's the difference? So I'm going to run you a little video, because you're probably getting tired of listening to my New York accent. And if you ever get up to Burbank, which you don't need a visa to actually get to Burbank, but we have a patient education center there. We got a fund, we got a foundation support. Uh, a generous donor, and so we have hundreds of videos of content of links to information 
that for everything related to any kind of adult hereditary disorder. So this is a, a, just a two minute video explaining what is kind of a, what we call SNPs or the polymorphisms. An entire set of 23 human chromosomes is called a genome. The human genome is composed of three billion base pairs. Variation at a single base pair is called a SNP, or single nucleotide polymorphism. When the body makes new cells, it doesn't make many mistakes. But nobody's perfect. Sometimes, when the genome is copied to make a new cell, a single base pair gets left out, added, or substituted. Single base pair substitutions create SNPs. There are around 10 million SNPs in the human genome, which account for many of the genetic differences between you and everyone else on the planet. Some SNPs account for differences in appearance, Others can affect how we develop diseases or respond to drugs. Most SNPs, however, seem to lead to no observable differences between people at all. Since variants are passed down from one generation to the next, the number of differences between your DNA and your neighbors can tell you how closely you are related to each other. Sort of to summarize, all of us in this room, 99.9% .9 of our DNA is exactly the same. So that itty bitty variation probably predicts for most of both our physical changes and our response and susceptibility to disease. It's also how we ascertain relatedness. So if you get into the ancestry.com kind of the, the ancestry testing or trying to do DNA fingerprinting, for whether or not you know you are the biologic relative of somebody else. It's all based on these tiny variations. In that, when we start to think about the polygenic, so when we look, when we talked about the 80% of people who don't have uh, hereditary, known hereditary susceptibility or get a cancer or a disease and don't have any family history, what we now start to understand is it's not just like chance, like shrug but that you may be loaded. And if you think about that on the far left is those who are stacked to a very protective genomic burden. These are the people who smoke for 70 years and they don't get lung cancer, right? There is a biologic reason that they are resistant to that. Is it that they, that they are biologically, you know, the, their antioxidants, their ability to clear those carcinogens, whatever that is or you can be very heavily stacked towards risk, and even if you optimize your lifestyle, that you're still vulnerable to disease. And being able to discern these differences will help to stratify, right? The slap, the, everybody should have a mammogram once a year. We know that that's probably not necessary. Who are the people that really need to start 10 years earlier? Who are the people who need higher risk surveillance? And who are the people who you don't need to be doing mammograms in every year? That's what we really want to try to separate in terms of the individuation of our care. So breast cancer has the farthest moved the farthest. We have the most amount of data. So this is the model to which we have the best ability to act. These enormous, it requires an enormous amount of data. If you think about one variation looking at hundreds, hundreds of thousands, 250,000 or 500,000 little variations to say, if you have an A and you have a T, is there a difference? You need that number, order of magnitude of people to be able to really say there is a difference between these groups. So they've done that with breast cancer. Studies of hundreds of thousands of women with and without breast cancer to say, can we separate the curves based on this genetic information? And if you're at the very bottom, that what was that all blue left? Your lifetime risk for breast cancer is 3%, and if you are in the very highest, 
your lifetime risk is up to 30%. So now that's a meaningful stratification. Having one of these variations doesn't mean anything, but in aggregate, 70 or 80 of them can start to parse people apart to say, we need to take care of you differently than somebody else. We have this for prostate cancer. We have this for breast cancer. It's in the moves for colon cancer. It is available on limited basis for cardiovascular coronary artery disease. But for breast cancer, it's estimated that about 20%, a little less than 20% of people would be stratified, would be moved into the very low, into a risk category where they didn't need the mammogram. Don't, you don't got to show up and start doing that right away. You don't have to have them every year. To the you're in high risk, we got to take care of you differently. <clears throat> so I, I mentioned this. And ovarian cancer is another, you know, one of the great um, nemesises of those of us who take care of women, right? N ovarian cancer is a terrifying disease for the very same reason that you, you can't, there's no screening, right? There's no effective screen. You don't feel anything. You don't bleed. We don't know you have it. And it presents in a way that is advanced at the time of presentation. So there's been a lot of work trying to find a, a marker for ovarian cancer. It has not yet been as effective. But it's clinically available for women and men who are uh, uh, at risk for both breast or prostate cancer, obviously gender, uh, and that we now incorporate the single gene testing and then this genomic testing to really try to personalize what is their risk and their care plan. Going back to the modifiable and the lifestyle, so this is an interesting paper from a couple of years ago. They took the same genomic information. So now they said, okay, how about our interventions? And this is happening in all aspects of medical care and doing pharma and therapeutics. Instead of just saying, we're going to treat everybody, let's try to target the people who, see, who are genetically responsive to our new drug and see how they do compared to just sort of giving it to everybody. And with the modifiables, they took 20,000 people and they said, okay, what are the things that are non-modifiable? Your genomic load, your family history, your height, and when you've had your children. The people who were at the highest genomic risk benefited the most from lifestyle intervention. So that is, a, to me, a reason to be doing this testing, to be able to say, hey, particularly for breast cancer, because the, the SNPs, those little variations we have, are highly predictive for estrogen-positive cancer, and estrogen-positive breast cancer is highly responsive to weight, to alcohol, to hormone uh, levels and hormone replacement. So these are all the things that we know to modify. So how do we tell somebody that for you, it's this, this seems to be okay, and for you, we really need to activate you in terms of optimizing ideal body weight and other kinds of things. And then the final phase. So we'll move through section one, the hereditary, a brief interlude into the genomics, and there is a lot more to the becoming related to sort of the genomics of risk. Um, I said I would mention in terms of the pharmacogenomics. So people ask all the time, you know, should they have this pharmacogenomic testing to know what medications to take? So for the most part, it's not yet applicable in that sort of broad spectrum. The pharmacogenomics has been focused on kind of variations in how your liver responds. So I tell people that it's a guide often to say, okay, you're somebody who is more likely to need less drug or less likely to respond to this category of drug, but it is not like a, this is your medication. This is excellent. This one only is going to work for you, and this is not. So the psychiatric uh, drugs have become very much in favor looking at genomics to say, to make choices, but um, they tend to default back to say, well, if you're not responding, then we'll go back to kind of the old way. Direct to consumer marketing. So there's been a, 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 in the same parallel where so much has changed from the hereditary cancer testing, the genomic testing hit the markets at about 2008 and it was completely unregulated. And there were like 40 companies that were just throwing up all kinds of things. The genomics of diet, genomics of who to date, like every kind of thing that was out there. And then a few companies, one of which, and I will, and when I bring up anything from a commercial company, I have I, sorry, I have no financial relationship with any of these, and I'm not um, highlighting or picking on anybody. But 23andMe is an important company because they have been leaders in this, uh, in this whole evolution. So in 
uh, the early, the late 2000s, 2008, 9, 10, there was this wild west of genomics that was just out there, and it was very often very expensive, and there was total lack of regulation or validation of any of that information. Then the FDA suddenly said, oh, something's going on here. People are having like medical testing, they're spitting and sending it in and sending in a thousand dollars, and it's totally unregulated. And they shut down the whole lot of them. They sent cease and desist across the board to all genomic testing companies. 23andMe said, we're going to do proof of principle. We are going to prove that we have good information and that we can communicate it in a way that is meaningful to people and that they can become their own citizen scientists and they can have ownership of their own genetic information. So what are the categories of genetic direct-to-consumer genetic tests? So there's ancestry, which is beautiful data and really interesting and very valid. So we'll talk about that a little bit. OG, that's me. Here's my distribution. Here's an enormously surprising piece of information. I am completely homogenous and I am totally Ashkenazi Jewish. Okay, so that's not a big surprise, right? And the more narrow your ancestral pool, the more uniform your DNA is compared to others. So the less variety, the less interesting you are. The more migration, these are based on where there were divergence. So it's all based on kind of an out of Africa principle in terms of human migration and that there are uh, known points of, of genetic divergence and that's how they kind of map out where your ancestry has come from. So mine happens to track back about 2,000 years to a migration of the Jewish people when they left the middle, when they left Palestine basically uh, during the diaspora and they went out into Eastern Europe, which is why they're called Ashkenazi or from the Eastern European, Russia and, and Polish area. And the migration pattern is completely predictable with sort of the, that human history. So that's cool. Didn't tell me anything I didn't know, but, but pretty valid. There, depending on where your ancestors came from and how much time in that migration, it may be pretty general. It, you may just get a your European, Northern European, Caucasian, and that's about it. Or you could get very narrow if you happen to have one of these divergence points to say, you know, you have 5% Mongolian ancestry because of the, the, that migration pattern or First Nation or other kinds of migrate. So that's ancestry. How about the wellness traits? So this is where they got into big trouble back a decade ago, predicting people's risk for both health and for response to exercise and to all kinds of things. But now it's kind of well categorized as being the, what I call the fun facts. So this is how, if you go into that, if you go into 23andMe, so the other companies don't offer the, the health-related information. There are uh, um, commercial products will take your genomic information and will push that through to other sources to give you information about health, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Those are much less validated than the ancestry type information or when we get into the health information that 23andMe now offers. So 23andMe, in pushing that envelope and saying it's not just about the fun facts, we really want to give out medical information, they decided that the way that they were going to prove that they could manage this in a novel way was with carrier testing. So remember we talked about sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis and these conditions which don't affect your health but could have a reproductive risk for you. So this is where they started. They said, can we do reproducible genetic genomic information on the platform that they have available, can communicate that back out to people and have them not freak out? And that's what they said that they were gonna do for the FDA and the FDA said, okay, show me that you can do it and they did and so they got approval for the first time to have non-clinical delivery of medical information. So this is the first time that, that this kind of information is outside of the purview of a clinical setting. 
you can spit, send in, and come back and find out if you're a carrier. If you are 65 years old, your family is done, it's not going to have a big implication for you. But what they were trying to do was really to say, we can deliver this information and people can understand it and, and nothing bad will happen. It does have their next generation or generation beyond that to know that there's a carrier for something, it could get to a point where it mattered for people. So that's what they started with. Then they started to push out behind a little bit more of that. But we're right now, I'm sorry, we're on the fun facts. Okay, so the health traits. So not the power of numbers. So initially, they were just using these little studies, so the genome-wide studies, looking at these comparators, the early studies, and there were thousands of them. It would, they would take 500 people who loved coffee, 500 people who hated coffee, they'd look at their genetic information, they'd say, oh, you have an A, you have a T, we've now found an association with coffee addiction, or whatever. And those got published, and they got published, they got turned over and over and over. And that's what all the original data was based on. There was no way that it could scale or apply to any one individual. Now, now they have the big data. Now they have the power of numbers. So, okay, so wellness, my, my muscle composition, um, power athlete, predisposed to be normal weight, okay, I can smell asparagus in my pee, terrific. And when am I likely to wake up? Okay, so the, like a super random variety of kind of interesting information that if it's, can you roll your tongue? Are your earlobes attached? Do, are you bald? Do you have curly hair? But it emphasizes, if the prediction is right, it certainly makes the buy-in to say, well, what is the other information that you might be telling me and that you can predict that too. So this is, they are, are now doing a lot of exploratory information. So with their five million users, they have huge data sets. So this is the prediction of whether or not you have a fear of heights. So they're using internal data, three, uh, three quarters of a million people, and they have anybody who enrolls in this, they send them big surveys. You don't have to be participating in this, but the whole idea is to be part of this, you know, citizen science. So they ask you a zillion questions. And then they're doing these analyses on, on their own internal data. So they looked at like 400 markers and they said, you, based on your age, your genomics, everything else, we predict you to not be afraid of heights. I have an almost paralytic fear of heights. So much so that when I became a lifeguard, I had to make everybody back off the high dive so that I could back down because I would not jump. So, you know, even though it's big data, the N of one, this is what I'm trying to tell you, is that so from this level, the granularity of that prediction is still not there. But the, the transition to that kind of data to what it might hold is pretty exciting. Finally, the reproductive and predisposition to disease. So there's been a lot of concern, direct to consumer. Is it reproducible? Is it good information? Is there consent? Do people know what they're getting? when you're really talking about health consequences that matter to you, not the fun facts, not the, okay, you're a carrier for something that could have consequence if you marry somebody else. And how is that information used? So these are what the things that they initially, right, the 40 recessive disorders. Then they started to push into the space of things that matter for the individual who's actually doing it, right? What's jumping off the page? Late onset, the vulnerability to late onset Alzheimer's, vulnerability to Parkinson's disease, age-related macular degeneration. The genomics of this information is pretty strong, but the ability to absolutely predict, this is, again, if you think that the hereditary testing is not 100%, the genomic risk is far less than that. So it might change like a, a few fold, or it might make you to have a 20% likelihood, but this is nuanced information and how does that translate into how you care for yourself or how you think about yourself or how you take care of yourself is a much less charted space. The, they have now a lot of disclaimers. So this also got passed through. This is all like FDA now stand up and approve. And they disclaim. They say, okay, our carrier reports can be used for carrier status, not whether or not you have a disease and it's not intended for that doesn't intend to tell you about your current state of health, this is the limitations to our test, right? It's not intended to diagnose disease. 
so there are a lot of disclaimers that are in there. How many people, when you, anything you're given to sign, anything you're given to read, read with that kind of um, intensity, every line to really understand what that information is? This is what's not really known. So this, for example, is the way the late Alzheimer's. You can have zero, one, or two of these variants. If you have zero, then you have a low risk for late onset Alzheimer's. If you have one of the variants, then you have maybe a two to three fold increase over the base population for late onset, meaning after the age of 80. And if you have two of these variants, then you have up to a 10 times increased risk. So having the, the, the rare combination of the two variants significantly increases your risk of late onset Alzheimer's. But if you're 35 and you're just doing this because you think it's fun to find out whether or not your asparagus, you can smell the asparagus in your pee, this may not be the time in your life that you're actually seeking out that information. And we have no idea about things like long-term disability, potential for discrimination, utility and use of this information. So this is where I have a lot of trepidation in terms of how are we translating this in a way that is both um, safe for the consumer and useful for the consumer and in addition to sort of disseminating the power of this knowledge. So, but moving back to the how do we find more people? I am 100% committed to the universality of trying to find out people who are at risk to whom I can clearly intervene and take care of. So 23andMe, again, charged forward and said, we're going to now push out and we're going to offer bracket testing or BRCA testing within the platform that they're able to do. So the limitations to the way that their genetic information, that this, their, their genotyping, the testing that they are offering, they cannot do comprehensive genetic testing. They can't test for the more than 1,000 mutations in BRCA, but they happen to be able to identify the three common mutations among people who are of Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish background. So, this happens to be this high-frequency recurrent mutation, and their platform can find it. So it took this big splash that said, now all of a sudden you can just get BRCA testing through 23andMe, even though for most people it has no consequence in terms of being able to identify this. It can identify people who would otherwise have no idea that they're carriers. This is the way you have to go through, so this has like a stopgap. So if you're doing this or the Parkinson's or the Alzheimer's testing, you have to go through a tutorial before you're allowed to view that report. So it asks you to do some learning and then to actively assent to say, I want this information. So I think that that's very, it's responsible. You can just go click, 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 click and not pay attention and then all of a sudden you're at the end and you go, <laughs> there's my result. Or you can, it is good content, it is well, it is, it is clear, it is at a level that is very understandable and it's short in terms of a, um, being able to sort of concisely say is this, what are the limitations and what are, what are the real value of this testing. So you go through this and it tells you what you could be at risk for, who it applies to, who it doesn't apply to, if you have a family history you should get evaluated anyway and, no, and it's not a substitute for going to the doctor, all the right things, it's all in there. And then you go, okay, fine. Whew, I don't carry that, okay? But that's kind of how you do it. You're sitting at home on your couch and you're click, click, clicking and you're not having a conversation, you're not asking questions and you're not necessarily engaged. You didn't do 23andMe testing to find out if you had hereditary breast cancer susceptibility. But now it's being suggested, do you wanna know this information? So it's a very different kind of approach to the medical information that we spend every day in clinic kind of walking people through. You can get your raw data. I'm gonna move through this, but just so that you understand if you start to use this. This is where things get very thin. So the whole idea of the raw data, not only is it that the predictability of all of this reams, people come in with reams and reams and reams of paper to say, interpret this for me. And it's really not interpretable. It's it, not only can I not get through it all, it, it doesn't have the kind of meaningful consequence. Buried in there, there might be some true hereditary susceptibilities, which would then need to be validated. And then they have like these 
green and red, like as if it's good or bad, but it doesn't actually assign level of risk. It's very complicated. And then, for example, this lab that 23andMe pushes it through has this disclaimer that says, if you're inclined to worry or have anxiety, this diet might not be right for you. Like, <laughs> that's just like super terrible. And, and how do you even find that? And, and oh, by the way, there is something called Snippedia which is the Wikipedia of SNP information, and just anybody can dump anything in there. So I did that study with the 50 people who loved coffee and the 50 people who hated coffee, and then I put it into Snippedia saying, I found an association. So that one is really uh, caveat emptor. One of the labs went back and said, okay, can we validate the, this, the information from this genotyping testing? And they found that um, in a small series that the false positive rate was almost 40%. And that has to do with the platform and the actual technology and that it is not really designed to have that kind of fidelity to, to be uh, detecting that level of mutation. So I caution strongly against utilizing this sort of direct-to-consumer ma marketing, uh, direct-to-consumer testing for health-related things at this time. The idea of having your DNA in your pocket, you know, and being able to whip it out when you go to the doctor and then have some, may be coming, but the, but the information is very, very complex to interpret, and we are not there yet, and I really want that to be sort of your walk-up on that. So here's the more recent case. So this has been for about the last year that this uh, BRCA testing has been available. 46-year-old lady comes in, she did 23andMe, she has one of these common mutations. Within the four months of having done the 23andMe testing, she went in, had it clinically confirmed, she indeed carried that mutation. She had a hysterectomy, had her ovaries removed, she's 46 years old. She had a breast MRI, she visited five breast surgeons, plastic surgeons, and had planned to have a bilateral mastectomy within four months of the initial diagnosis. Here's her family history. She's unaffected. She has young uh, children. Nobody in her immediate family has any cancer. In further exploration, there is an uncle here who had pancreatic and prostate cancer. We don't know where this came from. If she had walked in to probably any primary care provider, particularly up until very recently, nobody would have recommended testing for this lady. And there was no, no concept of sort of universally or, or carrier testing anybody just because they were Jewish for the BRCA mutations, although it's been in dialogue for a long time. So on the face of it, you say, this is it, right? Isn't this the reason why we're trying to do this universality? That we're trying to find people who you otherwise wouldn't know, the one in 40. That carrier frequency for a BRCA mutation is one in 40 in that population very high frequency, how do we find them? But what was the psychosocial fallout? This lady, at the time she did 23andMe, was in the middle of a divorce. It was a very emotionally stressful time for her. her she was about to lose her health insurance, which was tied to her soon-to-be ex. She had an underlying anxiety disorder. She was doing the 23andMe for fun, and then kind of got to the, oh, let me see if I'm a carrier, click, 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 and then went off the rails. I mean, that, that, the rate to which she pursued all those things was not out of, I am, you know, galvanized into action. It was, I am, you know, hurling along in terrifying, in sort of a terrifying way. She was paralyzed with indecision. Even though she had a bilateral mastectomy planned, she sat in the office for an hour and a half basically saying, this is the last thing I want to do, but I can't live with myself. She just was not psychologically prepared to make the, the walkthrough of the decision making that needed to be done. It is not to say that finding out that she was at risk wasn't potentially life saving for her, because I believe wholeheartedly that it was, and I believe wholeheartedly that we need to find people who are carriers before they get sick but I'm not sure that this mechanism in this way was certainly, it was definitely not right for her. And all she said was, I wish I never did this. So eventually, will she get to a place where she will feel like, I, I am really empowered, I really did things, and I have, I have saved myself the, uh, you know, a, what could be a horrible cancer legacy? Absolutely. But at this per period of time and in this mechanism, I, I think it was a disservice to her. 
So in close, let's finish first with the kind of what are the direct-to-consumer stuff. It can be very informative. It can be entertaining. There's a whole cascade of social networking that is now happening related to this direct. You can find lost cousins. You can find you know, family members maybe you didn't want to know that you had, all kinds of things. If we have a little time in the dialogue, I will tell you about the Golden State Killer and how they found him related to the genomic information. It can help screen for health factors, but you really have to be very clear about understanding what it does and does not have the implication and ability to do. Please, if you're going to do this, read very carefully. There is very good content. There's very clear information about, about whether or not they sell your DNA, whether they'll share your DNA, what is used for research or not. You now have, they've transformed all of this. Initially, you gave your DNA away. It was inherent in you signing up for the testing. Now you have to actively opt in to say, yes, I want to do re allow my DNA to be de-identified and used for research, or I don't, I can pull it. So, there has been a tremendous amount of progress to protect the consumer, to engage the consumer, but you have to be the advocate in terms of how you want to use that data. And if you have any testing that gets done for this, you must confirm it all through a true CLIA certified medical uh, uh, appropriate lab. Hereditary cancer, so, you know, family history matters. It will always matter, it continues to matter. Become your own, you know, the, the, the um, collector of information for your family. Repeatedly ask those questions whenever those family gatherings are. You know, just make that part of your legacy. Being negative for a genetic testing five years ago, ten years ago, or even a year ago does not mean that there's no risk. So this is a rapidly evolving space. We continue to add new genetic information. We have increasing ability to find mutations to improve on old tests and to better refine risk, even if there really is no single gene disorder. We are shifting away, and I think if anything else you realize from that idea that you have to be from this super high-risk family in order to have genetics to be relevant, that it is going to apply more and more broadly to the general population, and that this is where the power will lie. It is in the ability to really find everybody as the N of one and who is at risk. The cost is plummeting. The access is growing. This is getting to the tipping point where this is really finally going to be a place where we, it is going to be something. We couldn't even have conceived of doing something universal when every test cost five to ten thousand dollars. But now when you're on the order of, you know, a few hundred or less, it is now becoming to the, to the shifting point from the, from the preventive standpoint that you can really get to big numbers. There are a lot of targeted therapeutics for people who do have hereditary related cancer. So if you have somebody, if you or somebody in your family has had cancer, um, this is another opportunity. Sometimes people think that, well, I've had cancer, what do I need testing for? it? But it may change how your care for now or in the future. And that it's going to keep evolving into every aspect of adult disease and into chronic disease. And I am so impressed with everybody's attention. I thank you so much. And now I'm going to open the floor for questions. Thank you. CLIA, oh, I'm sorry. So CLIA is a certified, is, is basically the uh, body which um, uh, governs laboratory, the delivery of laboratory in a uh, regulated way. So it's the, the um, federal body basically that says that this is everything that this test, the outcome of this test has been, is reproducible and follows standards. Good question. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to take a seat and we're going to. So a big thank you to Dr. Gordon for an informative and engaging talk to keep you all entertained for an hour and a half in the evening here. Um, we're going to take questions. Hopefully you all were able to get some of those question cards. Katie's going to come around and collect them. So this is a perfect sequela to the question that you just answered. The first is, are 23andMe and other direct-to-consumer testing labs CLIA certified? In fact, they now have their, their the 23andMe, um, and the, they are not CLIA certified. So they push, so they
someone is adopted, but results are just as useful and interpretive. So if you have a positive result for a genetic mutation, it doesn't mean you have to know your family history to know how that applies to you. Um, there's still certainly action that can be taken as a result of a positive genetic test, even for someone who's adopted. All right. Um, are genetic mutations caused by factors? That is a little bit more of a complicated question with clarity between the somatic ones and the germline ones. So environmental risks, carcinogens, smoking, alcohol, radiation, right? Um, the I, one of the walk-offs of like if there's one thing you're going to change in your diet, it's to not eat processed meats. So uh, about six to eight months ago, the um, the IARC, the governing bodies on kind of environmental risks for cancers, came out and categorized uh, cured and processed meats. So that's bacon and like all the Italian deli meats and all those things that are so super delicious as um, category one carcinogens. So the fact that they can actually still be just on the shelf in, in, in restaurants is kind of hard to believe uh, that you know this came out and yet there's been not that change. So carcinogens do are mutagens. So everything that we say is cancer susceptible causing causes the potential for mutations in the cells of your body that are already defined your skin cells, your, your heart cells, your, you know, breast and, and other organs. And that same cascade of the, do you get more and more of those mutations that leads to cancer? Our body is um, really good at the immune system of clearing those bad cells. We have cancer cells floating around in our body all the time, and our immune system sweeps them away in the same way we sweep away viral and bacterial infections. It considers it a foreign body, and, and when cancer gets a hold, it's when it creates an invisible shield, and the cancer cell says, you can no longer see me, immune system. You don't know that I'm a cancer cell, so I'm going to hide and grow. So in that way, the environmental shifts, so can we reactivate um, our immune system? Can we optimize our environments? Uh, we certainly can, um, but you can't necessarily avoid the, you, you, there's no way, the years on the planet, there's no way you can avoid getting mutations in your cells. So that's a pretty long answer. I, I, did it address the question that was the person who was asking that? It's a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty big, it's, it's sort of the, the, the crux of why does cancer develop, and, um, and that's where really doing a lot to, to try to understand that and then to try to undo perhaps some of those environmental things. How do we reverse that through, through diet, through what is happening through exercise from an inflammatory standpoint and from a lot of other standpoints in terms of protecting ourselves? And that's a segue to uh, someone had asked what the difference was once again between hereditary and genetic cancers. And again, genetic cancers are a lot of those you can have changes in your genes impacted by the environment or your lifestyle or the aging process or hormonal processes in your body, uh, whereas true hereditary cancers are first caused by that change in the gene that you're born with, and then those subsequent you know, environment, lifestyle, hormone, et cetera, changes happen after that. So that's really the difference between the hereditary versus general genetic cancers and saying that all of them are genetic. And when they send off those tumor testing, right? So when, when you have a cancer and your doctor says, well, we're going to do genetic testing on your tumor, they're looking for these mutations, which may change, right? Because as the cancer gets, as you have chemotherapy, after you get radiation, it kills off some of those cancer cells. If the cancer cells are not completely killed off, the ones that survive and then grow back may be resistant or have acquired new mutations to, to escape what we're trying to do to get rid of the cancer. So that may also be some of the, the genetic testing that you hear about. And that's where also there's now the ability to do what's called a liquid biopsy. So rather than having to keep going in and sampling a cancer, that we now look through blood to say, are there changes in the DNA that we can identify that could target a therapy for somebody who has active cancer generally advanced cancer that has failed traditional treatments. 
And then there are a few questions about insurance coverage for the genetic counseling visit or the consultation with Dr. Gordon. Um, so in general, just as testing is covered, the counseling visit itself, the consultation visit, is really more universally covered. So you don't even need to meet those testing criteria to have the consultation piece of it. Um, so we often see people who are completely healthy, have no known family history of strong diseases, and are really just curious about what types of testing are out there. Um, so PPOs, Medicare, Medi-Cal, those types of insurances um, typically either, either cover the visit or the visit can be offered at a pretty low cost, right around $50 to $100. Um, HMOs, of course, you need an authorization from your doc, but again, typically a covered benefit for the consultation um, at an even wider level than it is the test itself. And then a specific question on aspirin. What dose of aspirin is actually used for colon cancer prevention, and is it the same as is used in heart disease and clots? So, you know, as a caution, and I'm not giving out medical information, you know, as a, without... So anybody who had a question, but just so that you know, or if you want to read about it, there, there were two groups of studies looking at aspirin for prevention. One is in the general population, and that used 81 milligrams, or the baby aspirin, which is the same dose used for heart health protection. Very recently, there was a reanalysis and sort of a, what's called a negative study, saying that the, the general population use of aspirin to prevent colon cancer didn't show enough benefit. But in anybody who is at elevated risk, it did show benefit. So it's the same thing that we we're talking about, sort of saying blanketing the, 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 the treatment, the therapy, or the screening to everybody versus those who are most likely to benefit. People who have hereditary cancer, we have known for a long time that the whole class of what's called non-steroidal, so from the ibuprofen-like drugs, aspirin is at the top of the heap. The interesting thing is that aspirin, if it tried to get through the FDA today, wouldn't be approved. Because of the bleeding risk, it would have been considered too high of a risk of a medication. But it is a remarkable anti-inflammatory. It, it basically blocks the, the inflammatory cascade in every, which, in every direction. So in the hereditary group, we actually use a much higher dose. We use two full-strength aspirins for a limited amount of time. Two years is, is what the current data is. So finding that point of what's the right for anyone based on their risk is what we use for aspirin. So I don't recommend necessarily everybody going home and starting to have take an aspirin a day if it's not otherwise indicated. But really, for those who might be best beneficial, it's an amazing, uh, amazing intervention. All right, so a number of 23andMe direct-to-consumer related questions, and I'm going to give you multiple of them because I think they're answered all globally. Yeah. Um, so it is, is my data secure if I do testing? Um, is it confidential for me to do genetic testing through these sites? And then can you be tested with an alias is the sequela to that if it is not secure and confidential? So, um, and, and you can, so each of the platforms has different, has different uh, decisions about how they handle your, your information and keep it private, and when they use it in a de-identified way if you agree to use it for research. And, and I only know as much as having read through uh, with, with, um, with a fine-tooth comb every one of these policies, and so I can only speak to it to that level. Um, and so they, the, the information is as secure as possible in terms of your privacy. In any breach of, of you know, informatics, there's the potential for your protected health information to get out in the same way you share it. You can use an alias. There, there's nothing that identifies you. You don't have to give anything that's secure other than from your payment standpoint that would tie you to you particularly. Um, it's really a matter of if you want to then connect to the, the, and you can make all the decisions about do you want to share your information and your name to find cousins, distant cousins, and all of other relatives. So that's all within your um, domain, and you can also uh, retract it at any point. Um, but they have a lot of caveats of, you know, the potential for, for information getting out. Once you take your raw DNA and push it through to any one of these other sites, and that is actually how they caught the Golden Gate Killer. Um, so that's, we're not going to talk about that now. We'll talk about it when people, if people want to stick around. <coughs> yep. So the next is any recommendations on 
formats or tools to help collect my family history, um, specifically ones that I can then easily share with my family members or medical providers. The one that I know of is the My Family Health History tool, um, which is easily, easily accessible via a Google. There are probably other ones though, that I don't know as much about. So, uh, yeah, so, the, um, so the, the My Family Health History tool is great, the CDC, so there are, um, but, but they're all of, any, if you just search, they're all pretty straightforward. I have a few on the slide up there in terms of just some websites to do that, but if you're internet savvy, it's easy enough. If not, you can um, just call us and we can also kind of give you some, some uh, uh, an easy um, review of kind of here are the questions to ask and how to build your tree. Um, so the next one is, are there specific markers for estrogen positive breast cancers that you can use genetic testing for? Um, so I'm not 100% sure you think the, the I think the question is, is based on, can you assess your risk for estrogen positive breast cancer? So yeah, so that's another, so there's a lot, there was a, um, there was a test a few years ago I don't think it was called Estra test, but there was something that was marketed as predictive for estrogen positive breast cancer. So as I mentioned, the genomic, the current genomic risk profile is very heavily predictive for estrogen positive breast cancer. That's what the run of the mill postmenopausal most people who get breast cancer have estrogen positive breast cancer. It's been um, and important trying to look at the people who actually get the estrogen negative breast cancer because that is a much more aggressive, much harder to manage disease. So now we're looking at kind of two groups and there's a whole genomic profile emerging for estrogen negative. If you walk in and have one of these genomic tests, it's really predictive for estrogen positive tests. If you have breast cancer, then there are profiles that are done again on the tumor to predict whether or not you should have chemotherapy or just get medication that blocks the estrogen. And so that might be somebody what's, what's asking about. And that, the first category, that was something called Oncotype DX. So that's looking at the profile of the tumor related to its estrogen and its aggressive behavior. This is a question from someone asking about how to get referred for genetic counseling and testing that I can take, yeah, it's cut off here, but this is a family health history tool, the CDC and the Department of Health Services. Uh, the bottom one says FORCE, so if you Google force.org, has a family health history tool as well. Um, so referrals for genetic counseling and testing, this is specifically for someone with an HMO uh, who does have an appropriate family history that would merit genetic testing. And what I typically empower patients to do if you feel like your GP might not be as responsive as you would hope in authorizing that referral with an HMO um, is often it can be helpful to actually bring them some criteria. So that's what I usually will have patients do. Uh, if you ever look up the NCCN is really our Bible, so to speak, for who should be referred for genetic counseling, who should consider genetic testing. Um, and it very clearly outlines the criteria that they use for referral. So I would encourage you to feel empowered to go online. You have to create a username and password, but you just put your email in, make up a password, print that paper out, um, and feel free to contact us and I can help you navigate that as well. Um, but that can often be very powerful in trying to get a general practitioner on board. Um, otherwise, we've helped to facilitate referrals for patients as well when they call us and say, I'm really interested in an appointment. Can you try to contact my primary care doctor's office? Um, so that can be another potential avenue. NCCN is National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN, open source. All right, so this is um, going a bit further into next-gen sequencing, asking what the difference is between a test like Foundation One and Mammoprint. Okay, so I think that gets a, it's a little narrow. Maybe that person can just come up and ask afterwards. But that's that's for people who have cancer, and that's looking at profiles for response to therapy or whether or not you should have chemotherapy. I would encourage. There's a couple of other questions uh, that ask really about specific family histories that they have, and I'd encourage those folks to come up afterwards as well um, to ask about your specific family history questions. So a more global question here, with regards to prevention, we often talk about medications or surgery, 
but are there other options like lifestyle or diet changes that actually have affiliated best practice guidelines and real evidence behind them? Um, so, you know, exercise and ideal body weight, I mean, it just seems like a, such a mundane thing, but it has extraordinary outcome. Ex the, the 150 minutes of exercise for um, prevention of recurrence of breast cancer, for example, or for prostate cancer, the reduction in risk is 60%. 60%, we can't touch that with almost any medication, and yet it's just somehow lost in terms of the power of being able to do that. I'm not sure if that's the, the, the specific related to, the, to that question. Um, there, you know, I did an integrated medicine fellowship really trying to see, get into uh, the evidence for supplements and other kinds of um, uh, interventions. There's a lot of growing, there's a tremendous amount of growing data related to mindfulness. So that's something that we didn't really touch on related to yoga and mindfulness, uh, both from uh, uh, prevention of recurrence of disease is where there's been a lot of work, and then a much uh, a great deal about symptom control for people who have cancer. But I'm, I, beyond that, and I'm not sure if there was a, a question in there that I'm not uh, addressing specifically. There's, you know, there's not the, the magic bullet uh, that, that uh, you know, nobody's told you about. So a question related to common conditions like glaucoma and diabetes, just asking about, you know, I've generally seen very little research related to genetics of these, but yet it seems to run in families. Can you explain a bit about why things that might run in families don't have genetic testing that we have available yet? Can I do that one or you go for it. <laughs> uh, so those are two great examples for whoever br brought that up. So type 2 diabetes is one of the most um, powerful hereditary index, right? So it is basically an autosomal dominant disease that is tremendously modified by environment. So if you're at risk, hereditary risk for type 2 diabetes, but you exercise and maintain an ideal body weight, you may never get type 2 diabetes. So this is w w one of the um, most interesting sort of disease models in trying to understand kind of that combination. The genetics of it, though, have been pretty elusive. So the genetics of hypertension, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, diabetes, I mean, the things that are really impacting our, our adult, late adult lives, um, there have not been a lot of single genes identified. That just, that's not the mechanism. It is this load that, that um, when I showed you the, sort of that polygenic risk. And so the, the genomic information, there actually has been a ton of research, and it's just on the tipping point of being able to say that this is really uh, meaningful from an application. So the coronary artery scores are meaningful. But the question is, where do you intervene? So for type 2 diabetes, if you're going to intervene based on somebody having a high genomic risk for type 2 diabetes, you have to start in school age. You have to start when they're five. So when are we going to be ready to start to say in the pediatric group, we're going to look for risk for adult disease so that we can make those lifestyle changes in the timeliness that it matters. By the time you have type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, your road is the same. We don't have a, a um, medical decision model that says you have a genomic risk, therefore you should be treated differently. In, in um, cholesterol, for example, if you have a hereditary risk for very high cholesterol that doesn't respond to normal statins, we do know that there is a genetic choice for medication. So there are certain circumstances where the genetic information really may inform, but in these common chronic diseases where all that work is really going, it's in the genomics, and it just hasn't moved yet to a place where it, it translates to saying, now we, we know how to take care of you differently from a prevention standpoint. But it's coming. It's coming. So I think we have time for just one of these last questions. And like I said, for those that we weren't able to get to, please come up and ask. Um, but the question is, if I have Alzheimer's disease in my family, how do I know when I might benefit from something like APOE testing? And would that actually be of benefit versus these true hereditary Alzheimer's cases? So hereditary early onset Alzheimer's disease has very formal criteria in that 
the diagnosis for the disease has to be under the age of 65, and that's a pretty big demarcator, right? So most people who have Alzheimer's are presenting in the eighth decade of life or, or later. So that's the, the cardinal sign. Then there is a, in somebody who has that early uh, uh, dementia or early progressive dementia, even finding out whether it's truly Alzheimer's or not, now there's a whole profile that defines, it used to be that Alzheimer's was an autopsy diagnosis. To truly have it, you had to do a brain biopsy. But now we have a combination of markers that really can indicate, including spinal taps and blood markers, to say this is Alzheimer's, and then um, be able to try to target treatment in that. The late Alzheimer's, so APOE is only risk for the late Alzheimer's or a diagnosis of Alzheimer's in somebody who has dementia. So if you're 40 and you have a family history of having a grandparent at 85 who had Alzheimer's, then I don't think that there's really meaningful, I don't think it's meaningful in either regard, that the early onset, the three genes associated with early onset is clearly not what's happening in your family and that to know your APOE status at the age of 40 is not gonna be meaningful in how you need to take care of your, your own health. I used to be very resistant to APOE testing in general, but now there's um, really a lot of research going into uh, early intervention medication related to the APOE, actually the lipid. So I think that when that's there, now being able to, to find somebody who's at risk that might benefit from a preventive standpoint, that's when it's gonna be kind of a change to a tipping point. Fantastic. And so a question, and this is probably one for Katie, is uh, will the slides be available after the talk to be emailed out to people who would be interested? So they'll be up in a week on the providence.org website for anyone who's interested. All right, thank you all, and thank you again to Dr. Gordon. Uh -huh.